Welcome everybody to week three, day one. We're going to be talking about truth today, what truth means. And so, uh, first of all, I guess I'd like for you guys to tell me what your understanding of truth is. I'm going to be pausing this video at certain points um, to give you guys a chance to um, write back on chat. So if you're watching the recording later and you see like jerks in it, it's because I'm pausing it rather than sitting there staring at you guys for like a minute. So uh, let's flip over to here. Truth is one of the great questions in philosophy. There's a whole field of philosophy called epistemology, subfield. Um, that just studies what it means for something to be true. But I'd like to get your feedback right now. Like, what what is your understanding of what truth means? If I say it's true, you know, something, 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 something is true. What does that mean? What does that mean to you? Okay, so we got truth is something that's true. Truth is something that's factual. It's kind of a synonym. So the truth, I know the truth means that somebody's being honest about the topic they're talking about. Something is legit. Truth is an expression where there's two options, true or false. Truth is the logic of honesty. Uh, it means if my chair is black, my cousin says it's black, it's true. Okay. Uh, so that's an example of something being true. Uh, it can be backed up with factual evidence. Again, saying facts and truth. In the AM section, I'm like, what is truth? The guy's like, it's that which is factual. What is factual? That which is true. It's like, um, true is something that can be confirmed and backed up with evidence. Okay. True is something perceived as correct. All right. True is actually sort of evidence pointing out their claim with evidence to back it up. Okay. Supported by facts can be proven. Something based in reality or fact. I like that. It can be seen and proven. So, <clears throat> Sean, uh, are there true things that cannot be seen? Like if I were to add a quadrillion and a quadrillion together, I'd get two quadrillion. Can you see that? You prove it in math. Can you see it? You have quadrillion rocks or apples sitting around. Something is true when there are not multiple stories behind it. That's interesting. Story-based truth. I like that. True is the fact you can back up and it's legit. Uh, when it's true, it means something proven with evidence, uh, result of the argument, because it correct or incorrect. Truth is something that people perceive based on what they believe. Okay. Again, you know, I think there, you know, probably some things that are true that you can't perceive, right? Truth is the absolute. Okay. That's provocative, but what does that mean, Sabrina? Give me, give me more information on what it means for truth to be the absolute. Um, truth is telling something like it is. That's right. You don't come up with fake professors and things like that. Be supported by facts. Uh, Candy with a second crack at the thing other than uh, <laughs> being legit. Uh, when it's true, it's proven evidence. It's sometimes a witness. Okay. Um, Sure, we'll, we'll go with that. Trump's social media. <laughs> it's true because there is no other option. It is undoubtable. Okay. Truth refers to a state or quality of being in accordance with fact or reality. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, don't just Google things. Go on. Uh, to be true is to have concrete support, such as trust me, bro. <laughs> I like that one. Um, so, yeah, in agreement with based on reality or fact. Yeah, don't, yeah. Um, don't just, uh, don't just Google things. All right, come on. Like, I, I want to hear your opinion on it. Um, so, accepted by the majority of people. Okay, interesting also. Right. Um, so here's a statement. War is the continuation of politics by other means. It's from this book here, which is a nice, small, easy reading uh, book called On War by Karl von Clausewitz. Um, a Defense of Swamps. If you want to learn how to defend swamps, that's your book. And uh, <laughs> uh, what uh, do you think this means? War is a Continuation of politics by other means. 
Like, what does this mean to you? When, when, when Clausewitz says, war is the continuation of politics by other means. What does that, what does that mean to you? Okay, so we got some good responses here. Um, I think this means that where both sides can't come to a conclusion by words, they use other means. I, I, I think, uh, Sean, that's a, that's a great response there. Um, right, like right now the European Union is trying to get natural gas out of Russia, but they don't want to support the Russian war in Ukraine. And so uh, they're currently negotiating to like buy natural gas from Russia at like a reduced cost so that Putin can't profit from it, but at the same time, like they kind of want to get their natural gas so they don't freeze. Um, so that's politics, right? Politics between countries involves negotiations. Hey, I want this. You give me this. I'll give you this. You know, and if you can't um, accomplish it via politics, then you send gunboats over to their country and be like, "Stop being closed. Please open your country, Japan." And uh, right, so. Um, Japan had had, uh, under their Sakaku policy, they'd had a lot of European countries other than the Dutch try to trade with them. And they're like, no, uh, only the Dutch, Dutch only. They're the only people who can trade with us. And then, uh, America sent the gunboats, uh, under, uh, Perry to, uh, forcibly open the, the country and they didn't go to war, but they had some cannons there. And so they were able to achieve their goal of trading with Japan via war or a threat of war. Uh, versus, you know, just pure, pure politics. Noah says, I would say all wars started because of political conflicts. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, like there's probably some war sometime that was caused by, you know, some guy just like, screw you, you know, like invading. But usually it's like, because there's something that a country wants, right? There's usually a point to a war, right? Like right now, Russia says that they're, uh, uh, their ostensible reason for invading Ukraine is because Ukraine has been taken over by Nazis, right? And uh, Nazis are everywhere in Ukraine, and so they need to denazify Ukraine, which is um, appallingly stupid on the surface, right? Because like Zelensky is like Jewish, right? And the the percentage of Nazis in Ukraine is like trivial. Like there, there's probably some, but it's like not a significant amount. But um, you know, that's their ostensible reason. They're going to come in and denazify Ukraine. Or you could say that their uh, goal is to seize territory from Ukraine, right? Like they took Crimea a few years back and now they're trying to take Eastern Ukraine as well. And so um, most wars are uh, political that escalate into war, right? Uh, <clears throat> war is built of conflicts that lead into a physical one. Yeah. Um, so uh, people feel like, uh, where's the result of political conflict and just the fiscal representation of it. Yeah, it's a good way of putting it. Um, they can't negotiate, so war will start. Yeah, like in, in the Gulf War, right? Like uh, the first one. Uh, <clears throat> Iraq, Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait. His goal was to take Kuwait and their oil fields. Uh, I think he was alleging that Kuwait was like slant drilling into like Iraq's oil fields and stealing their oil. And so negotiations failed, so he invaded Kuwait to seize the country and, you know, stop them from slant drilling. I don't know if they were or not, but <coughs> then America enters the war with the goal of pushing Iraq back into Iraq again. Right. And so, but again, there was a, there was a diplomatic phase, right? Like where America was negotiating with Iraq, like, Hey, if you leave, we won't attack you. And, uh, Saddam Hussein's like, no. And then, so America invaded and pushed Iraq back to Iraq again didn't depose Saddam, like that wasn't our war goal. Our war goal was just to liberate Kuwait, right? The first Gulf War. Then of course, you know, we ended up getting into Gulf War II. Um, so, um, yeah, like I'm, I'm sure you can find some non-politically based wars out there somewhere, but um, generally speaking, like there's a political objective that wants to be accomplished and when they can't accomplish it, war is sort of the continuation of those political means. Uh, war since our two parties don't agree with the results or anything. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right, all right. So do you guys think that this statement is true? And think about what you were just saying a second ago as to what true means under that criteria, you know, like, um, if you say truth is telling something like it is, 
you know, is this telling something like it is? Uh, is it, uh, you know, something that could be seen and proven, Sean? Is it uh, something perceived as correct? Whatever, whatever um, definition you gave for truth a second ago, I want you to tell me, is this statement here true using that? Is your, if your chair is black, your cousin says it's black, it's true. So I don't know how you're going to work that one. I don't know how many chairs are involved. In wars, there was the War of the Bucket, of course. Uh, wasn't a chair, though. Right. The common myth is it was caused by stealing a bucket, but the bucket was taken after the war. So not a chair in any event. And of course, you have the the Emu War. Right. That 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 might be a war that uh, was not. A continuation of politics by other means. I don't know. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, so the EMU war was when uh, Australia declared war against the EMUs and lost. Right? So, uh, I think it's true because what we've seen this about countless times. There have been many different wars caused by different conflicts. Um, back then, politics wasn't really involved, it was just conquering lands like Genghis Khan. I mean, Genghis Khan actually, like his typical thing actually was to send political envoys to a country and like try to negotiate with them. And then what happened over and over again is that they would like chop the heads off the uh, the diplomats from Genghis Khan and Genghis Khan would get really upset about that and go over and like burn their country, you know, and slaughter everybody because you don't kill diplomats, right? So, um. I don't know. There's multiple layers to truth. Some truths can be proven to be cold, hard facts. Some people have subjective truths, which derive from opinions. However, it's almost impossible to determine an opinion as fact or false. Um, in a way, truth isn't always concrete and straightforward, like we described it. <clears throat> uh, it can be found in advice, metaphors, and philosophy. There is truth in words. I like that. Uh, I think it's true because we've seen different signs. There have been many different wars caused by people disagreeing with each other. Um... Yeah, all good, all good insights. He was like, let's make this quicker and easier than politics because I'm invading anyways and sacrifice diplomats over time. I don't know. Like, I, I don't get the feeling like he was deliberately trying to sacrifice his diplomats. You know what I mean? Like, uh, um, like I, I, I get the feeling that Genghis Khan actually believed in the sanctity of diplomats. And so like when people like chop the heads off them, like an envoy, like you'd always just say no and like send them back, you know, but like when they were like, decapitate them. Like that seemed to make uh, Khan uh, pretty mad. You know. So, uh, maybe the real truth is the friends we met along the way. Beautiful. People with enough power can determine what's true and what's not. So that's funny. Because that's uh, uh, this one here. What do you guys think of this? There is no truth, only power. Uh... Do you guys think this is true? There is no such thing as truth. There's only power. Maybe the real memes you hate are the friends you made along the way. <laughs> That's it. I'm dropping the class. <laughs> There's a point there. Manipulation and control. <clears throat> I feel it's on the person what their perception of truth is. Real truth is up to the expert guys. Listen to the experts. <clears throat> Power can guide you away from or to truth. That's that's actually a pretty uh, pretty interesting take, right? Like, you know, when you have power, power sort of means control and uh, uh, coercion sometimes, right? And so you can force people towards the truth or away from it. You know, like the Nazis were famous for using. Um, propaganda to like sort of push people away from the truth right uh i think it's true okay why uh sure uh power can have control on the truth however truth is still perceived by individuals yeah it's a nice it's a nice take right ultimate power unlimited power yeah. <laughs> um Depends on both sides' basis. People in power can force others to see something as true. There you go. Okay. 
Uh, it could be true because having power is worth more than the truth. That's interesting. Power can influence facts, but the truth is always there. Yeah. So it seems like a lot of you guys are saying there there is truth, which is separate from power, but power can sort of like um, influence people's ability to perceive the truth, which is pre pretty interesting take. I like that. I've always heard that the victors of history write history. Yeah, you know, kind of. Um, it's kind of true and kind of not, right? Like, obviously, um, you know, the people that survive are the people that get to write the history, right? But um, sometimes the losing sides write histories too. You know, if they're not murdered to the last person, you know, people on the losing side can, can write can write histories and find those out. Also, you know, even on the, the winning side, like that assumes that historians are more interested in making their country look good than in truth. So um, it, it's kind of an urban legend that victors write the history books. Uh, but at the same time, there is a certain amount of truth to that, right? Like if you look at our, our history of World War II, um, Hitler gets treated much worse than Stalin, right? Um, Stalin was on our side. And so he gets kind of a pass because for all the you know atrocities and things like that he did because he was on the Allies' side. He was on the winning side. Um, at the uh, Nuremberg Trials, um, they put uh, the um, president of um, the guy who succeeded after Hitler uh, shot himself. Uh, what was his name? Donut, Donuts? Donuts? What was his name? Oh, Donuts. Donuts? Yeah, that guy. They put him on trial at the um, Nuremberg Trials. And uh, <clears throat> so he was involved in like the disruption of peace and things like that. But the one thing that um, he got uh, found innocent on was um, he was accused of uh, conducting unre unrestricted submarine, submarine warfare, which means shooting transports and things like that. Like nobody gets in trouble for shooting a battleship with a torpedo. But if you shoot like a transport ship containing like, you know, innocent, innocent civilians, uh, they, he was put on trial at Nuremberg for that. And he's like, well, you know, um, you guys did it too, you know. <laughs> and so, like, none, none of the Allied uh, submarine commanders were put on trial for unrestricted submarine warfare, right? Even though we were shooting transports of the Japanese. Like, that was a big part of America's uh, Pacific strategy, right? And so they actually had the submarine commanders testify on his behalf saying, uh, yeah, we kind of do the same thing. And so he was let off on that one, but for his uh, involvement in, like, you know, the invasion of Europe, like, uh, he was found guilty for that. So just trust me, bro. Yeah. Um, so um, another interesting concept is that of fog of war. <clears throat> People believe money is true. Um, yeah. And so, but the point is like, when you're talking about like history is written by the victors, right? Like the losers were put on trial for war crimes. The winning side wasn't put on trial for war crimes. You know what I mean? Uh, but at the same time, like, you know, it is a case where like the winning side was like, yeah, kind of, we did the same thing. So, um, do you guys see what I'm saying there? Like, it's, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, um, it's kind of true. <laughs> I would say that uh, history is written by the, the victors and it's kind of, kind of false. It's, it's complicated. Okay. So, uh, fog of war. So the fog of war is a term you'll see in video games like age of empires and, uh, um, Warcraft, Starcraft, games like that, where like you can't see further away from your units. Um, the term also comes from Clausewitz's On War. And so um, uh, the notion is like when you're in a war scenario, you're gonna have you're gonna you're a general, right? And you've got scouts coming in, and this and one scout says, Hey, um, the enemy army is is that way. And you have another scout coming in, like, boss, boss, the, the enemy army is that way. And you have to decide what to do. Like, if you split your army into two halves, you're going to lose because you're going to be out number two to one. Let's say you're even size. Um, and if you make the wrong decision, then you're probably going to lose also because you're going to be out of position. And so this, you know, humans like having certainty. We like having all the facts in. We like being able to base our decisions on mounds of peer-reviewed evidence and things like that. Uh, but in reality, in 
especially in crisis situations where you don't have the time to just sit back and wait five years for the studies to come in, um, you have to make decisions now. And this creates uncertainty and doubt and paralysis. I don't know what to do. And this is actually a problem that a lot of people today have because a lot of people today don't like acting unless they're like certain that they know something is true. So what crisis has happened in the last couple of years in which you had to make uh, decisions, maybe life and death decisions in your own life and the life of your family and society around you without having all the facts in. I feel like there's no solution to this issue because there's no way of knowing. Yeah, there's no, there's not a great solution, you know, like, like, the, but that's the, that's the point, right? Like so there are, sometimes there are just no good solutions, right? Like you're going to be, you have a chance of being wrong no matter what you do. Sitting still is, it could be wrong, right? If you sit still and let the enemy army come to you, you lose. So, uh, so what is the, uh, <clears throat> What, what in your life in the last, like, oh, I don't know, three years was a scenario in which you had to make life and death decisions without perfect information under your belt? Okay, so yeah, the, uh, obviously the, uh, the answer is the coronavirus pandemic, right? Um, when everything locked down, right? We got contradictory information over whether masks work, right? Um, the CDC said, you know, masks don't work, don't don't take them, and then they said, now you have to use them. And uh, there's been, you know, back and forth over different issues over the coronavirus uh, for you know three years now. But you don't have the luxury when you're in a crisis situation of just being like, well, you know, I'll just wait five years and find out if you know masks work. I'll wait five years and find out if vitamin D supplementation works. I'll I'll kick back and um, live my life as I was doing uh, when that might expose you to coronavirus and you know, have a chance to die, right? And so <clears throat> you have to, like, in the moment, and, and this is something that, like I said, modern people just don't have a really good um, mental mindset for, really, you, is you've got to do the research, you got to discover, you know, the facts as best you can find, but even even still, you're going to get some contradictory information. You're going to get partial and imperfect information. You got to execute a plan anyway, and the best plan you can anyway. So, uh, uh, I have the high ground. Is by the way, a Star Wars reference, not a Fortnite reference. So. <laughs> okay, uh, switching your pistol is always faster than reloading Sun Sea. That's funny. Uh, okay, so do you think this theory is true? Do you think that Clausewitz was right about the fog of war? So the Fortnite got changed to Star Wars. All right, cool. So uh, yeah, the story is usually one side to make the winning side look better. Uh, no, it's not Oric on right now, Diego. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, he probably said it all because no one truly knows everything. At the end of the day, there's a chance I might be right to win. During times of stress, especially war, waiting for answers might take too long. You have to act. Yeah. I believe it's true. Yeah. I mean, again, it's a question of like, what does true mean, right? Like, in, in this case, this is almost like advice, and advice isn't... I mean, what does it mean for advice to be true? You know, like, you should... You know, you need to act. You need to plan. You need to, you know, handle things like this. Like, it's a command. Commands can't be true or false, but... It seems like you guys are saying, well, yeah, his observations here are correct or something like that. So, uh, people always feel the need to fight for what's right, or at least what they believe is right. Um, uh, true always alters with different people because they have a different basis. I don't know what it means. Um, okay. So, truth. Okay. So, we'll go into theories of truth in a second. Um, first of all, let's talk about knowledge. So, to know something usually means... If I say I know that Joe Biden is president of the United States, this means three things. And uh, sometimes people add a fourth due to the, it's called the Gideon objection, but um, it's not important for here. So if I say I know that Joe Biden is president, this is typically understood to mean three things. First of all, Joe Biden is in fact president. It's true that Joe Biden is president. 
second, that I can justify it. So when I say I know something, it's more than just like, you know, uh, I believe it to be true and it is true. It means I can justify it to be true. So I can actually like check, right? I can go to the White House website and the White House website here has uh, Biden on it. it. Says President Biden. Got President Biden here. President Joe Biden there. President Joseph R. Biden there. What does the R stand for? Yeah, Joseph R. Biden. Robinette. That's an interesting middle name. Okay. Robinette. I did not know that. Okay. So I can check. I can check. Right. And if the White House isn't enough for you, I could probably check outside sources as well. And I can justify to you that uh, Joe Biden is, in fact, president. And uh, in general, like, facts about the world are always decaying, right? Like, it's possible that, um, you know, Kamala Harris died a half second ago, right? And the website hasn't updated yet. So there's always a chance that you're, you're wrong, right? Like, um, in, uh, it was either this class or the 19 class last week that um, I talked about the uh, FAFSA requiring you to register for the selective service for the draft. <clears throat> and uh, it's not true anymore. Like they, they modified it in 2020. I didn't know that. Right. So he, he said his name three times. He's been summoned. <laughs> <coughs> One learns new things every day. Yeah, it's true. So um, knowledge is the thing that comes from those weird things called books, right? So... That leads into this question here. How do you know things? Like, I'm sure you know lots of things, right? Horses have four legs. The capital of Virginia is Richmond. Um, water is H2O. How do you, how did you come to know those things? By which mechanisms did you learn? How did you acquire the information that the capital of Virginia is Richmond, that horses have four legs, and that water is H2O? Okay, so for the horse one, we can phys physically see that one, right? Like we're here in Fresno and Fresno has different horse, you know, ranches around here. And you can be like, oh, okay, there's a horse. It's got four legs, all right. But uh, I'm, how many people here have been to Richmond, Virginia? Have you ever seen a nine-legged horse? I've seen an eight-legged horse, not a nine-legged horse. Right, Loki's kid, right? Odin's steed. One, two, three, four. No, you can't see the back legs. Eight-legged horse slept near. There you go. For real? Uh, in, in real life, I've seen a, a stuffed horse that has eight legs. So, um, I don't know if it's real or not. I mean, I've seen it with my own eyes, though. Uh, <clears throat> what? Oh, you didn't know that Schleppner was Loki's kid? Yeah. Um, Loki's, uh, Loki's kids and were Hela, uh, which is definitely a departure, uh, in the Marvel universe, right? Hela takes over, like, like is the older sister of Thor and Loki in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Uh, but in <clears throat> actual, um, I don't want to say history, in actual Norse mythology, Hela, Hel is Loki's daughter. Half decaying, half perfect skin, um, rules the underworld. Kid number one. Kid number two is Fenris Wolf, which is uh, um, the wolf that eats the sun at the end of time in Ragnarok. You have the Jormungard, who is the world serpent that encircles the world and will, again, destroy the world or not because Thor, you know, kills it. And also one of Loki's kids is Schleipnir, the eight-legged horse. So there you go. Out of, <coughs> out of his kids, like one of them is vaguely human. The rest of them are pretty messed up looking. Okay, but okay, so we can observe horses. How many? But nobody here has been to Richmond. So yeah, you're taught you're taught by parents or teachers, right? And so you have to like trust me, bro. That they're telling the truth, right? Like you have to trust that you know they're reporting things to you. You can read things in a textbook. So basically, you acquire knowledge through two ways, right? Through your eyes, through reading a textbook, reading a book. You can see a picture of a horse. Or you can observe a horse yourself, or you're, you acquire it through your ears, right? You, uh, you're taught, um, you know, in fifth grade, your U.S. state capitals, and you have to learn that the capital of um, 
Kansas is Topeka or whatever, you know. Anyone know where Kansas City is? What state Kansas City is in? How do you know that a horse is called a horse? I don't know, man. It's too deep for me. Arkansas? Arkansas? One hydrogen, two oxygen. I mean, have you ever seen like an individual water atom? Like, probably not, you know. But uh, you can do the. But with with water, you can do a science experiment, right? You can take pure hydrogen, pure oxygen, put them together into some sort of container, spark, you get an explosion. Water is produced as a result of it. You can't see air, but you know that it's there. Yeah. So, <clears throat> Heimdall's pretty awesome. Yeah. Be like water, water abs. Like it was the Bruce Lee quote. It absorbs the form of the thing. Go buy hydrogen or local save warrant. Yeah, so Kansas City is in Missouri. And it's the largest city in Missouri. So there you go. But everyone thinks, well, Oklahoma City's in Oklahoma, so Kansas City must be in Kansas, right? All right, uh, yeah, so that covers like most of the, the cases, but uh, I buy all my elemental products at Nerds R Us. So <clears throat> that doesn't cover some things like this though. So another way you can know something is just by thinking about it, right? Like if I, if I, um, if I asked you to prove uh, the two quadrillion plus two quadrillion equals four quadrillion, how many of you would like go out there and be like, all right, I'm going to pick up four quadrillion apples, you know, and like count them or how many of them would just do it in their head? You know what I mean? <clears throat> so it's possible, right? You're going to meet a defeat. No, I'd, I'd do it in my head. Right. And so, <coughs> and so that was something that a lot of you guys left off is that you can actually learn that something is true through pure reason, right? Not everything has to be, empirical not everything has to be through through observation you can learn new facts through just thinking about them if you if you start with um uh, a set of uh axioms in mathematics you can prove all sorts of interesting things to be true for example uh you can prove that the square root of two is rational it's impossible if you look at something it's impossible to observe an irrational number every time you take a measurement of something you get a rational number out of it but um, in math, you can prove that the square root of 2, which is the diagonal of a square, is rational. When If you take the ratio of the side of a square to the diagonal of the square, it's always going to be rational. So have you ever seen what a single water molecule looks like? Yeah. So, uh, so this is called a priori reasoning. Okay. So there are two great schools of thought as to how you can actually know something. One is just by thinking about it, right? Like if I know what a bachelor is, and a bachelor is an unmarried male, uh, then I can prove to you that there are no unmarried, uh, sorry, there are no married bachelors in New York, right? I don't actually have to go to New York and observe all the people in New York and ask them, hey, are you a married bachelor or not? I can actually know just by sitting on my couch at home, I can know there are no married bachelors in New York because married and bachelor are logical uh, opposites. It's a contradiction for a person to be both married and unmarried at the same time. So this is called a priori reasoning. A priori means beforehand and it means before an observation. I can know, I can know that there are no married bachelors in New York prior to doing an observation of people in New York. <clears throat> and uh, a posteriori is by contrast, scientific reasoning and empirical reasoning, observation based, right? Um, so you observe a bunch of horses and you're like, Four legs, four legs, four legs, four legs. That one has three legs. Looks like he had an accident. Sorry. Uh, four legs, four legs. You know, and so you reason, okay, well, probably horses have four legs then unless they have an accident or something. Um, or likewise, you can sit there and do experiments with hydrogen and oxygen and make water. You're like, okay, well, you know, uh, it looks like we use two parts of, ox of hydrogen for every one part of oxygen. Therefore, water is probably H2O. And so science uses a posteriori. This means after an observation, reasoning, and a priori is before an observation. Okay. Didn't have to cut me off. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so 
what is going to be on your quiz today are these two concepts to make sure you understand which is uh, which. Can you identify a priori reasoning versus a posteriori reasoning? And we're going to go over five theories of truth in this class, actually six, but one of them is not official. And so you're going to have to learn uh, three of them today, and we'll go over the other three on Wednesday. So, <coughs> excuse me. So correspondence theory is the one that a lot of you guys were talking about, right? Something is factual, right? So what correspondence theory is, is something is true if you can look at reality and be like, there it is. It's true, right? Therefore, the statement, I have a bass guitar next to me is true because if you look at this old mirrored image here, you can see I've got a bass guitar behind me, right? It's not my bass guitar, but it's a bass guitar. Do you play the bass guitar? No. I don't, but I have a bass guitar right next to me right here. Okay. So uh, it is true that the statement, I have a bass guitar next to me is true because there is actually a bass guitar next to me. It is true that there is a, a scroll involving Guan Yu and Zhang Fei uh, right here. Because in reality, look, it's there. I can point to it. Like that's that's a scroll with uh, Guan Yu and Zhang Fei and Liu Bei is kind of off the, he's out of, being cut off by the edge of the screen, but so uh, it could be a green screen, yeah. And 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 that's one of the problems with correspondence theory, right? Is that we make observations all the time, but they could be wrong, right? There's, <coughs> um, yeah. here here's correspondence theory. You know it's cold outside when you go outside and it's cold, right? It's correspondence theory. There you go. It's cold outside, all right? So um, there is uh, a lot of uh, optical illusions. Like this thing here is called the, the phi illusion. The phi, 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 pho, fum. <coughs> Schrodinger's box. No, nothing, nothing is like highfalutin as that. So if you guys look at the, um, the gaps going around the screen, you can see it's just gray, right? Like it's just, there's just one of those pink dots is deleted and sequence in the animated GIF here. But what I want you to do is to look at the cross here. So if you look at the cross, then what color circle do you see moving around the, the circle there? Green. You see green. And what? Yeah. All right. And uh, sometimes, like, the pink dots disappear entirely, depending on how far away you are. The pink dots might completely get erased, and all you see is a green dot moving around. Depends how close you are to the screen, I guess. Okay? And so, you know, everybody's uh, observing a green dot right now, right? <clears throat> and if you kind of follow your eye around the, the, the edges, like, sometimes you'll see, like, a blue dot kind of. But like, yeah, everybody's seeing a green dot. Yeah, it's cap, right? <laughs> um, but we're all observing. And so from the point of view of like a um, person who has co correspondence theory, this is a problem, right? Because you have everybody agreeing, there is a green dot there moving around in a circle, and there is no green anywhere within that image, right? There's no, like if you were to look at the, the, the GIF file, not a single pixel within that whole image was green. We still observe a green, a green image. And so it's a problem with correspondence theory, which is that we can all observe something that's not actually there. And so it's sort of a problem. Okay. <clears throat> the white and gold dress, yeah. You mean the blue and gold dress, right? <laughs> if you're colorblind, do you still see green? I don't know. It's a good question. Um, or ghosts or something like that, right? Like a lot of people uh, have seen ghosts, right? And so... It's like if you believe in correspondence theory and something's true if you can observe it and a lot of people have observed ghosts, then ghosts are real. Which is a problem because most correspondence theory people are science people and that makes them feel very awkward to say, it, you know. And so a lot of science is actually based on the notion of like trying to like correct for the mistakes and observations, right? Like people can make mistakes, people have error, and there's observational error in all sorts of different ways. You can measure you know, the temperature wrong, you can um, set up your experiment wrong, 
Um, you know, your Bunsen burner isn't turned to the right heat. There's a lot of ways you can make mistakes. Um, and a lot of science is just trying to correct for those mistakes. But ultimately, correspondence is based on you being able to point to reality and say, look, snow is white. I said snow is white. It is true that snow is white because look, if you go out there, snow is actually white. You know, unless it's yellow. Now reality, it could be whatever I want. <laughs> right. <clears throat> so coherence theory, second theory of truth you have to learn from today, uh, lines up more with a priori reasoning, right? So a posteriori reasoning is used for correspondence theory. You observe something, that makes it true. Coherence theory ties in very closely with a priori reasoning. Um, so with coherence theory, you prove things to be true based on things you already know to be true. So, for example, if I if I uh, assume to be true, my axioms, you know, in mathematics, you start with axioms that are self-evidently true, let's say. Um, let's say, you know, there's a number line, right? The natural numbers, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, you know, the counting numbers, whatever you want to call them. Sometimes zero is included in that, sometimes they're not, who cares? So let's say I give you, like, here's the here's what a number line is, right? You're like, all right, cool, that seems true to me, you know, all right, cool. And then I tell you how addition works. If I say, if you add X, you move X spots to the right on the number line. All right, cool. You know, and then from those starting axioms, I can prove that two plus two equals four, right? You start at two, you move two to the right, you're not four. And, um, and so that is a truth that was generated from other truths that you know. And so this is used all the time in logic and mathematics. You prove things to be true using a starting point of things that you know to be true. Um, or if you don't use it, if you want to use it outside of um, logic and, and mathematics and things like that, you can say like, well, okay, so you're telling me that George Washington did X, Y, and Z. Yeah, that seems to match what I know about him. I believe you, right? And so like, you've got a web of like concepts inside of your head of things you know to be true. And like when a new fact comes in, you see if it like matches all the other facts that you have. You're like, yeah, that seems true. All right, I accept that. But if you come in and say, yeah, George Washington actually like, you know, he was three feet tall. You're like, yeah, that doesn't sound right to me. You know, you reject it. And so coherence theory is also kind of how the human brain works because the human brain works that way. We work, we have like a set of associations and facts within our brain. And we tend to accept things that match our facts and reject things that don't. The final kind of theory of truth, we'll go over this real simply, uh, is pragmatic theory. Pragmatic theory is that which is true is that which is beneficial to us. So who cares if gravity is actually true or not? Um, you know, scientifically speaking, what matters is if I jump off a building, I'll die. So it's beneficial for me to treat gravity as if it was true, even though in science, there seems to be this fundamental mathematical conflict between general relativity and quantum mechanics at the smallest levels. Gravity doesn't seem to work mathematically speaking. And so we're pretty confident that either gravity is wrong or quantum mechanics is wrong, or they're both wrong, or they both need to be revised, however you want to put it. But who cares? Because if you jump off a building, you'll die. So uh, pragmatic theory of truth says, uh, basically, you got to do these two things as much as you can. Like do science and find out as much as you can through science, do reason and find out as much as you can through reason. But if you get to a point where it's just like, I don't know what the right answer is, then pick the answer that is most beneficial to you. For example, in William James's time, they were talking about radiation. Like they, they thought that there was this thing called conservation of energy, like energy cannot be created or destroyed. But then they were discovering these rocks and you could just put the rock on your desk and it would just sit there and generate electric, not electricity, but heat, right? Which you could turn into electricity, right? And so they discovered radium and uranium and some other stuff like that. And if you could just have a rock, they would just sit there and generate energy all day long. And, and it made no sense to anybody because it seemed to violate the laws of conservation of energy. And William James is like, who cares? It seems as if both of these are right. And maybe down the line, we'll figure out which one's right and which one's wrong. But um, in the meantime, like, let's treat them both as if they're right. Because they, they both seem beneficial to us. So, you know, undoubtedly, you've got this rock that pays energy out of its own pocket somehow. Um, so let's use it. Let's make some nuclear energy or something. You know? I don't know. And so his, his whole thing was uh, based on his personal... Uh, experience with uh, depression and determinism and free will. So he, uh, when he was in college, he became very depressed because he felt like 
All of us were just clockwork automatons following the laws of nature, and we had no free will, and any decision we made was made for us by the universe. And he was very depressed by this. And he was just laying in his bed all day and not doing anything. And then he realized, well, he doesn't actually know if predestination and determinism is true or not. In fact, there's some good arguments to be made for free will. So he's like, well, you know, if you've got some evidence for predestination, some evidence for free will, I'm going to choose the one that benefits me more. I'm going to choose free will. And as such, it like invigorated him. It filled him with energy. And he, he actually ended up living a very interesting life. He became a professor of psychology at Harvard and, and developed the pragmatic theory of truth with uh, Charles Sanders Pierce. And uh, did investigations in the variety of re religious experiences and all this kind of stuff. And all as a result of his pragmatic theory of truth. So your job on the quiz is to be able to identify a statement. Like if I make a statement of fact, like this uh, cup here is empty, is true because you can look at it and it's empty. Right? You would have to identify that as being correspondence theory, et cetera, et cetera. Do you guys have any questions about these theories of truth? Because it's going to be what you're tested on today. It's full of error. What do you mean? Yeah, fair enough. Uh, this apple here is red because look, it's actually red. Teachers change the world one child at a time. Wow, so inspirational. Is that apple real? I don't know, man. <laughs> any questions? The empty cup theory. <laughs> Cups are drained by negativity. Red is an object. <laughs> Already on it, coach. Yeah. Is the cup half empty, half full? All right. Well, it sounds like you guys uh, got it then. Uh, thanks for coming out. And I will see you guys. Did I pour a drink? I, I, you can smell colors? It's interesting. What color? What What does yellow smell like? <laughs> lemon okay that's good all right tastes like red i'll see you guys on wednesday peace out